Hello everyone and welcome back to River City Girls. We just finished the second boss, so it's time to move on. I actually had a question about boss design and say a beat em up where you don't want them to be like too hard, but at the same time it is a fairly simplistic kind of genre. So how do you go about making them interesting compared to say a you know, a more platformer kind of boss where you're you may have a little bit more creativity? Uh, I mean, I think the main part is, yeah, you try to look for ways that you can do variety, and it is a lot more challenging in a brawler where you have, you know, typically kind of human characters, because at a certain level they do kind of feel like the players. So, I mean, we look for things like, uh, you know, can we get the player, the, the boss jumping around? Can they de be doing magic or projectiles? Can they be doing, you know... Uh, uh, kind of weird sequences that are, you know, kind of breaking outside of what the standard combat is. But it's also kind of a double-edged sword because at the same time, if you go too bizarre with it, then it's not really taking advantage of the fact that the players learned how to combat well against fairly standard enemies. So you look for a little bit of both, um, you know, and in, in, in this game, we have some like Masuzu, the first boss is pretty standard. She does kind of the jumping around you know, long jumps, Hulk, Hulk jumps or whatever. But beyond that, most of her attacks are relatively brawlery. And then as you go through and you get to uh, pretty much all the other ones, they start, like, you know, getting some very weird attacks and very weird modes and stuff. But we always at least try to bring them back to brawling fundamentals, kind of do an ebb and flow back together. Because if they're essentially just existing purely as a non-brawler style boss, then it's just going to feel weird. It's going to feel like you know, overly challenging to, to even get a hold of them. Yeah, I, I just ask because we have a fairly done uh, usual boss coming up that's more kind of the fly around and zip around characters rather than a straight up brawl. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Bari. Uh, I just fought her last night, actually. I'm playing through this game um, as we commentate, and uh, <laughs> Hey, Bari, it took me. Well, she, she was the first boss this playthrough that gave me real trouble. She took me four tries. Like, and on my fourth try, I ran back to the shop and stocked up on video games for full heals. So, of course, the attempt I made after that, I didn't need any healing items at all, and I just won. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because that's how that works. I wonder if I was one of the only ones that liked that boss, but eh, we'll get to that shortly. <laughs> I really enjoyed Hibari, actually. It's it was it was just such an unusual boss that I kind of had to recalibrate myself before I, I got on its level. It helped that on my third attempt, I realized I can just wall jump and hit this boss. I don't have to aim that stupid needle at it. <laughs> yeah, we tried to look for opportunities like that with the wall jumping and then also um, like having her in some of the later cycles flying down so she's within jumping standard jumping heights looking for stuff like that because you know again the the I, I like the back and forth with her in terms of the the you know we don't want to get too far ahead but the needle and knocking her down and wailing on her but we we wanted to make sure that there was some of the kind of standard stuff there but yeah it, it you know the that was one where I believe we tweaked it a little bit in the post-launch pass. Um, we got some feedback from people that, that Habari and, uh, and Aboba were both pretty difficult. And again, I think a lot of that, like you guys mentioned, was people going in without any healing items, really trying to just do one and done it without any kind of, you know, additional uh, uh, beefing of their health. But, um, but that was also, you know you were only working on this thing for like a year and change. And so you get them as good as possible, but it can be a challenge sometimes when you aim really high and, and the idea of trying to do even a shooter style bullet hell boss in this game, when none of the other systems are remotely related to that definitely was, was biting off a lot. Oh yeah. I understand what, what actually got me most of the time wasn't how difficult it was to hit her or anything of that nature. I actually figured that part out fairly fast what tended to kill me was in the third phase, when she starts shooting a lot of projectiles, the projectiles would juggle me into other projectiles, yeah. and I would just take a lot of damage in one go, because I was just I was positioned just perfectly enough that I would take about 20 hits before my character fell out of their juggle animation, and and there would be my health gone, and I used up all my healing items on my first attempt, so... Oops. <laughs> Yeah, we always try and try and address, 
you know, perfect storms of damage and, you know, getting cheesed by the bosses and stuff. But that stuff is difficult, yeah, because, I mean, you know, the, honestly, people people will see some stuff that they don't like in a game and say, I can't believe you left this in there. And I'll, honestly, a lot of it is like, wow, we never quite encountered that when we were, we were playing through it. And that's why, you know, a big part of once we're done with these games and we release them, we really watch people playing them on YouTube, playing on them on Twitter. And if we see things popping up that are not anticipated as much as possible we'll try to address those in a patch or or you know give players some guidance on discord or stuff like that oh i definitely understand that and and to be fair hibari is also a fairly forgiving boss apart from apart from that one element because she also spawns um she also spawns a couple of zombie mooks uh, yes an old nightmare students that uh sometimes actually quite often in my case drop little health items so yep, yep. that was why i didn't wind up needing the health items that i bought on my fourth attempt because all the damage all the damage i took got her i think all all, all the bosses are kind of they're really forcing you to to learn them and i think that i mean again you know it's it's obviously it's biased i'm working on the game for you know over <laughs> a year and i get really used to them um but uh but with all of them, as long as you bring in a little bit of food and as long as you learn their patterns, um, they're not that difficult to work around. I think what we see a lot in, in people playing through them is trying to kind of just brute force it and just say like, I don't want to, you know, jump when a Bobo does this attack or I don't want to dodge when Habari does this attack and really just kind of power through it. And, you know, that those are the situations if you don't learn them and kind of, you know, work from the way that you learn, that's the way these bosses are in these games is, is uh, they really benefit players that kind of, you know, learn their, their play styles and learn their little like ebb and flow of how they, you know, when they attack and, and when they're vulnerable. And we get that from, you know, classic Nintendo bosses, Capcom bosses. Um, yeah, but that's, that's, I think that's one thing that, you know, they're not just a sponge where you're meant to just go up and just wail on them until they run out of health. You're meant to kind of go back and forth between fight and flight with, with the, with a rhythm on these guys. Yeah, and I, and, you know, I'm having fun doing that. It, it is a little, it is a little bit rough trying to get myself into the rhythm of dodging side to side, or rather up and down. Yeah, but yeah. that's that's more because my controller is a Switch controller, which is which is designed along that Xbox 360 way of, oh, oh God, why did why did it become so popular to put the D-pad in such an uncomfortable place? Um, I, I still don't understand that mentality of controller design, but everyone does it, and and that's. And that's just the world we live in. A world where D-pads are off in a corner somewhere where your thumb can't reach them without cramping. Yep. Oh, are we helping Dumpster Boy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. We're helping good. I just we got this right here. It's right on the way. I'm playing through the game at a relatively sl at a relatively relaxed pace, so I'm doing all the side quests and taking some time to grind a bit of money here and there to collect some extra accessories just to um, experiment with things. I figured I'd really try to get into the into the meat of the technical details, so I have a little mod that turns on the damage numbers, and oh, that's nice. a that's a question I I actually wanted to ask. How do you feel about stuff like mods? Just as We're, a game designer, yeah, we see like they talk about it a lot in the way forward Discord with like the PC versions of the game. As long as it's not breaking the experience for somebody else, or you know, exploiting it in a way that harms someone else's experience negatively, we don't have any issue with it. So you know, we're not going to be like elitist and say, oh no, this is you know your you're changing the way that, that the directorial intent and blah, blah, blah. We don't really care about that stuff. I think, you know, where it would get dodgy is if players are adjusting things and then especially now in the sequel going online or with the Steam. I know with the first uh, game you can kind of connect multiplayer with Steam. If you're doing something that is going to negatively affect somebody else or be uh, a, a cheat to somebody else, I think that's... A little unfortunate but as long as it's just kind of like hey this is how i you know i paid for the game and i have it available to me to tweak some things and this is how i want to enjoy the game we don't have any issues with that so basically as long as everyone involved is is okay with whatever mods are in there and it's not like screwing up some competitive leaderboard or something yeah exactly and i mean you know and it's also again this is all good feedback for us so you know on the first game we saw the kind of things that not only people were struggling with but the people were also modding and then that all factored into you know us looking at the brand going forward like do we need to make this 
you know, a certain element uh, more automated or more easy or more apparent. We're always looking at uh, at, at user feedback, and and you know, obviously, it's it's very strong feedback. If somebody wants to spend the the time to actually do the work to to modify the game, then that's a pretty compelling uh, uh, rationale, as opposed to. Uh, even more so, I think, than somebody just saying, like, oh, I didn't like this one thing, because they're actually putting in the time to, to adjust that. Oh, yeah. That, that makes sense. That's that's basically most of what the mod that I installed does, is just quality of life stuff. Like, yep, yep. Uh, some people don't like having the interact button and the attack button as the same button, so they, there's a function to remap, and it defaults to the actually the recruit attack button, which uh, turned out to work pretty well for me. Yeah, that was one of the most challenging things, and it was really because we were trying to come up with a system that was universal to all the platforms, including the Switch, which would have two-player local co-op on the Joy-Con. So you, you start losing buttons, and you start losing button playability, and you know the launch version of the, the game um, really was... That was our, our biggest point of feedback uh, once the game launched, is because you could immediately go through a door, and people were constantly accidentally going through it. With the, the post-launch patch, we at least made it so you hold the button down, and that seems to largely alleviate um, some of the accident of people accidentally... Uh, warping out of a place when they wanted to just be fighting um but it's 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 tricky because i mean especially it's it's still you're still kind of running into situations where uh, even after we made the patch then people would say well now it's throwing off my speed runs now it's slowing down the flow a little yeah. bit yeah yeah the, the the mod patch i the mod patch i have does have an option to uh instantly go through doors but i didn't see any point in turning that on for my playthrough because it occurred to me that there might be a weapon next to the door or right. something, and I might want to, and I might want to pick that up and not leave the room. Right. So, yeah. uh, and that and that turned out to be a valid concern because I got really, I, I was I was really fond of the boomerangs once I discovered those, <laughs> but I I could never nail the timing for catching them when they come back. So mm -hmm. what I would just do is throw them across the room and then dodge out of the way as they as they let them, them hit a wall behind you. Yeah. Yeah. So it would always land next to the door. And uh, I, 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 I realized as I was doing this, wow, I'm glad I left that option off because it would have been a real headache while I'm yeah. using these boomerangs. Yeah, that's a, that's a challenging one. That, that is one of my favorite things, though, is, yeah, playing catch with the boomerangs, playing catch with uh, the dodgeballs and stuff like that. I mean, definitely it's one of the hardest timings, I think, is... Uh, um, playing baseball, having one player throw the baseball, the other person swinging the bat, because it just goes so fast. Mm. Of course, having the having having the damage numbers uh, turned on it turned out to be a really useful thing because I I I found out things about the game system that I probably wouldn't have noticed otherwise. For example, there's um, there's a there's a critical damage thing that happens when you throw a weapon at an enemy when it is about yep. to break. Yep. Um, but all other throw attacks with the weapons do actually, well, at least with Misako, less damage than they would if you hit them in melee with the weapon. So Yeah, we have a little visual indicator on that where it starts flashing red when it's basically ready to break. Yeah, I'm just not sure I would have made that connection at all if I hadn't turned the damage numbers on. No, um, yeah. I also discovered stuff like that running forward and uh, kicking upward move that Misako does with her special with her special meter actually does quite a lot of damage on impact and I initially thought that was that was just a launcher that wasn't yep. especially remarkable otherwise but it turned out to be one of my big boss buster moves once I discovered that oh that's cool <laughs> whereas um, one of my favorite moves as I'm sure most folks have been seeing uh, I actually have a genuine question about it I have no issue with it the rainbow dab I, I, I genuinely want to know uh, why it was included, because I w I'm fine with it, but I know that some people are just annoyed with uh, asserting with dominance through rainbows. <laughs> I think... I think people. I, I think some people are just real stick in the mug, mu muds about the dab too, in general. But you know what? It seems like a very Kyoko type move. So yeah, that's what it is at the end of the day. And I, I that one was, uh, I believe, added by uh, 
uh, Bannon Rudis, uh, my AD on this game, and he he did he directed the second game, and then Ku, our lead animator, and just you know a lot of what the moves ended up coming out as were just what made sense for the personality, and I was really happy about that as they were proposing things and getting things functioning because I think with everything being very high personality in the story and the art design and stuff, if it was just kind of you know standard attacks. I think it would feel a little bit disconnected from that. So, you know, we we were very well aware of the divisiveness of, of putting a dab in there. And I think the first time I saw the first version of it, I really rolled my eyes and I was like, come on guys, seriously. But uh, but it's just, it, it feels Kyoko. It feels, you know, they're, they're teenage girls and, and, and she's very like, you know, uh, cutesy and, and loves, you know, trendy stuff and things. So it seemed like something that, that she would do. And here we have Habari and Mommy being their bad selves again. Actually, yeah, now that I'm playing through now that I'm playing through the game again, Hasabe and Mommy are really starting to get under my skin <laughs> in a way that they didn't before. I don't know. Maybe it's because like this time I'm actually going for the statues and I'm gonna fight the yep, yep. the alternate boss. But but like uh, I'm starting to watch these cutscenes thinking I can't wait until I can punch their teeth. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's getting it's getting to a point where uh, where I'm I'm kind of taking it personally when they insult Misako and and, and Kyoko. Uh there there are certain parts where the insulting may or may not be justified. Again, we'll get to that. But uh you know, knowing uh, feminine products, that's a low blow, I think. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, no. Um it's it's kind of a juvenile form of bullying, but at the same time it's just it, it, it's just it's just sharp-tongued enough that I I I I found myself shaking my head at the monitor and I'm just like you'll get what's coming to you one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> just 10 more statues to go. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things, yeah, is is watching people on Twitch react to Hasabe and Mommy because they get so vocal, like, oh my god, I can't stand those girls, and, and very carefully engineered. Like, you know, that was their purpose. You can't attack them. You can't even, I don't believe, get a response from attacking them. Yeah. Like, they don't even flinch. And, uh, and really building up that that hatred uh the uh, you know I, I i'm a big fan of just tropes and and the mean girl the rival girl tropes like I, anytime i have a game with like teenage characters i usually have some form of that in there and so they were just really fun to play that up with it's um it's a pretty it's a pretty stark alternate universe version of these two characters because um conceptually at least I can't really speak to the general storytelling style of, of Kunio Kun because a lot of the games haven't come out here. But conceptually, one of them is an ex Sukaban, and the other, I think, is just this sweet girl who saw the good in Kunio or something. Or maybe it was Ricky. I'm, I, I, I can never keep in my head which, which, which concept goes with which girlfriend. But I think it's Misako with uh, Kunio and uh, Kyoko with Ricky, but I may have it backwards too. Yeah, the the um, uh, the point is that that, that conceptually, uh, the Hasabe and mommy are, ma uh, Hasabe and mommy are kind of like written as being, um, as being tropes of that sort of delinquent teenager genre of fiction that you sometimes see in Japanese movies and whatnot. Yeah, or even just like I mean things like Mean Girls, literally the Mean Girls movie stuff like that. I haven't watched that, so I can't really speak to that. It's just but... very, very biting, snarky dialogue of between teenage girls. Uh, speaking, and... of... go ahead. No, well, well, I was speaking of the original Hasabe and Mommy, not yep. uh, not so much these two. Yeah, we um... didn't. We really tried to kind of reinvent the characters. You know, we didn't like set out to, you know. Uh, disregard what came before but we very consciously decided we weren't going to be totally beholden to it either so we would look up the back histories on characters we would see how they operated more than anything kind of what their role was so i mean like an example is you know you saw earlier hiroshi um you know he's always somebody who's kind of like information dump guy or the 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 uh you know friend who's in distress sort of thing so we kind of had him in like a similar kind of like 
info dump kind of helper not really fighter role but then his personality we just really made our own and i think that's something that i don't know that's just the sweet spot that we landed because we didn't want to be too beholden to how all the characters were before because we're also cramming you know characters from 30 plus games into one game and now you know two games um so there would be a lot of redundancies if we played up all of the characters like very true to their origins i think a lot of them would feel redundant or would feel a little flat um so we were always looking for like what is the like most high energy kind of uh, uh crazy over the top version of these characters that that we could put in this game i think it, i think it's generally it's just for this particular this particular game series it was probably a, a really good idea on pretty much every level to just start afresh with new versions of everything because uh particularly here in the west um, a lot of these games never came yep. out, and when they did, they were localized so that the characters were named stuff different. And I think, I think uh, River City Underground actually used the Western localization names, yep, didn't it? Yep, yep. Alex and Ryan. Yep. Uh, yeah. So like it, it's not like a lot of the audience over here is going to get all of that um, if you were to stick with it. It's not even necessarily consistent within those games because I, I think it was explained to us, I might have mentioned this before, where Ark said there's sort of multi-timeline universes and so technically I believe uh, Kunio Tachi no Banka, the, the game that featured Kyoko, that's a sort of a different universe than the games that come from the River City Ransom uh, era and, and, and so even their versions of the characters are kind of all over the place but yeah I think you know it's just you'd spend so much time trying to get it perfect and it's not consistent anyways because you know the the Masako and Kunio Tachino Banka is pretty close to ours I mean ours is you know a little more high personality but she's still gruff and grumbly and then you look in most of the games and she's like a total sweetheart with a bow in her hair and so you know you have to make choices anyways about what version of character she go for like in River City Zero, they make no mention of Misako's role in other games, where she's like the soccer team yep, coach yep. or something, and it's like okay, in in that game's like even their idol animation is like doing that sort of crouch sitting thing that you would associate with a with, with a delinquent in Japanese yep, yep. high school, and um, it it just doesn't it it doesn't entirely fit with what I know of her from other games, and. Yeah, yeah, I can see what you're saying. It's, it, it it's, it's kind of, it's kind of weird trying to, trying to deal with, um, with consi with characterization consistency in a, in a universe where characterization isn't really consistent to begin with. That does make me ask, though. Um, considering Japan has gotten over, you know, like 50 games of these. How did the reception to character, story, etc. go over there, if you happen to know? You know, um, we've asked Ark about that, and, uh, you know, because we, we don't see as much direct play of it. I know it's popular over there, because I know, you know, they've licensed it into a number of different things. It was supposed to be a stage play this past December, but it ended up not happening, I think, because of COVID and stuff. But I know, I know footage of the game got into an anime this yeah, I saw that. That was really cool too. That, that was awesome. I remember. I, I remember. I was. I watched um, the completionist's review, and he went to some sort of like food truck events in. Japan. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh no, that was here. That was here in Los Angeles. It was, and it was yeah, in we, Los Angeles. Yeah, we wow. have a, a Japanese themed food truck uh, that we're friends with, Okamoto Kitchen, and so they they made the items real, so you could actually get a, a Merv burger and get Merv fries and all that. Yeah, we've tried to do a little bit of that here, but Ark is really good about that stuff. So if you go in Japan, I mean, the girls have appeared in other art games. They've appeared in other non-art games where they get licensed out. Um, I think, as far as I can tell, uh, one of the few times that I've asked they say that that people in japan like it but they see it as a different thing so that's part of why probably they went with uh, the guide in title basically saying like this is a weird version of kunio kun this is not you know it's not 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 canonical but it's 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 a, an offshoot as opposed to you know they're still doing the the fairly traditional games with three kingdoms and melee mock and all that kind of stuff um, but i think i think it's pretty well received i mean they were very happy with it we definitely see a lot of fan art from uh, the japanese uh, uh online art communities and stuff so um they seem to be digging it oh that's cool to hear 
I'm always, uh, I always get a little bit nervous about that kind of thing because it can be a bit touch and go with, uh, yeah. with the reputation of Western games in Japan and particularly a Western takes on Japanese properties. Ooh, yeah, that's the boomerang. <laughs> There's yeah, boomerang. I, I, um, I actually had a game design question because, well, it, I appreciate that we've had a lot of different topics here, which we kind of need to go through this lack of elevator segment. Uh, why was this put in here? Was this a joke? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It was just, you know, just me and, and Bannon kind of thinking, what do we want to do for each stage? What do we want to do that's that's interesting? Um, and we just decided, like, hey, at this point in the game, like, let's just do, like, a gauntlet type thing where you're kind of, like, having to go through waves of enemies, but then every now and then you get a break for food or for items or stuff like that. Um, I don't, I don't really remember too much other than just, like, Hey, we got to go downstairs. This would be a good opportunity for one of those things, and it's a, it's you know a classic gameism is like having something where you have to go through four or five, six waves in like a confined area. Often you're in the elevator, like we've done that on uh, we did an X Men game where you're doing waves of enemies as they're jumping into the elevator. This is one step removed because the elevator is broken. Um, yeah, I was yeah. Say, is this is this like an anti elevator section? In yeah, yeah. Life? But just I mean, just looking for like you know, at the end of the day, we're telling our story, we're unfolding our attacks, and and we're like debuting all these different areas, and it's like, how are we going to get some good gameplay length out of this? And uh, and that like having a gauntlet going through seemed seemed pretty good for that section. That's all I really remember. <laughs> oh, I, also, I, it's Skullmageddon. Yep. Inten intentional or not, it made me laugh because I did like the idea of an anti-elevator section. Yeah. Skull, Skull, Skullmageddon also made me laugh because the voice acting is just really on point. I don't know why. Yeah, he was fun to bring back. So he was an original Way Forward creation from Double Dragon Neon uh, a little over a decade ago, or about a decade ago. And uh, and the director of that game, Sean Velasco, voiced him. So we actually, even though he's not a Way Forward anymore, we brought him back to voice him in this game and then RCG2. Um, very Skeletor voice. But I like the absurdity of, you know, in that game... Double Dragon Neon, he's trying to take over the world at such high stakes, and after that, now he's just hanging out in a little pawn shop, and so that's that's just a sort of, like, absurd juxtaposition we like, and same thing with, like, we have Burnov later, uh, mini-boss from Double Dragon, and now he's a bouncer, and of course, a Bobo is all over the place with his jobs. It's really fun to kind of reimagine these characters uh, and what their roles would be uh, the, that we grew up with in the NES era. Maybe Skullmageddon's just biding his time, uh, selling a lot of merchandise like the Doriaki and the Coco Soda, hope I said that right. And maybe once enough money is made, then he'll try to take over again. It's entirely possible, yeah. And uh, you actually, with the collector's, physical collector's edition of River City 2, you get a Skullmageddon coupon, and it has picture of him and I, I, it just has like so much fine print about like only on Tuesdays, only on certain items, only when you spend over a million dollars, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but not everyone's going to have a million. Oh, that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And the elevator's finally working. <laughs> 